On June 7, 2021, about a month after the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, the FBI announced that they seized 63.7 bitcoins from the Dark Side ransomware gang. While it coincided with the Chinese crypto crackdown, the news of the FBI's seizure was partially credited for the subsequent cryptocurrency market crash. It challenged people's notion that Bitcoin was anonymous and that the decentralized currency couldn't be controlled like the US dollar. Since then, the crypto tracking industry has exploded. The cryptocurrency analytics startup Chainalysis has landed over $60 million in US federal government contracts, helping the agencies like the Justice Department and the Treasury Department, among other government agencies, track crypto transactions. They mainly pay for the blockchain tracing software called Reactor that maps transactions. Another company, TRM Labs, sells software that tracks altcoins. In early 2023, they landed a contract with the Treasury Department and were hired alongside Chainalysis to track funds stolen in the FTX debacle. Many of the largest crypto companies hire companies like TRM and Chainalysis to help monitor their customers' activity and comply with anti-money laundering laws. There's even been reports of an unknown group linking Bitcoin transactions to IP addresses since at least 2018. This is our technical analysis of how crypto is tracked and traced back to real-world identities. Outside of privacy-centric currencies like Monero, which we explain in a separate video, many like Ethereum and Bitcoin operate on similar blockchain protocols. Let's use Bitcoin as the example. It operates on a decentralized network of nodes that host a distributed database of timestamp transactions that are viewable by the public. This is commonly called the distributed ledger or public ledger. For example, we can look up the Colonial Pipeline ransom payment. The FBI released the partial address, which people quickly matched with the time and the amount to find the exact transaction. This can be looked up in any blockchain explorer that facilitates access to the public ledger, like Blockshare.com. In the Colonial Pipeline case, the FBI just tracked the initial ransom payment and then each subsequent payment until its final address, all on the public ledger. With ransomware threat actors, we will often see the same patterns between them. The victim sends the ransom payment, it'll pass through some intermediary addresses, then usually the funds are split into multiple payments with the same split percentages sent to the ransomware developer, the hacker who deployed the ransomware, and other associates. This is called a taint analysis. These transactions are between wallets that in theory have anonymous addresses and don't reveal real people's identities. Although, as you'll see, these can be de-anonymized in a number of different ways. Let's get the obvious out of the way first. Centralized crypto exchanges and centralized custodial wallets all verify the identities of the account owners. So any wallet the funds are transferred into is linked to the account owner. What is more interesting is how organizations trace crypto bought and sold on decentralized exchanges that do not require any information from the users, that is then sent to wallets that do not require any information from the users. Thus, the wallet addresses are not associated with any identity. Hardware wallets and any decentralized self-custodial wallets are examples of this. Although the hardware wallet manufacturer provides the public key for each wallet, so the manufacturer may have some record of the associated public key and purchaser. Remember the wallet address is a hash of the public key. Important to note that decentralized exchanges usually only exchange cryptocurrencies. They usually do not exchange fiat currency for crypto. That is because governments heavily regulate how their currencies can be exchanged. So to exchange for fiat currency like the US dollar will require going through a centralized exchange. More on this later. The tracking softwares like TRM and Chainalysis Reactor are also analyzing transactions on the ledger, but then associating the wallet addresses with real-world identities by using open-source intelligence. This means scanning social media, the dark web, and other places on the internet for the wallet addresses and other transaction information. So anyone who has shared their address online or shared transaction information can easily have their addresses associated with their real-world identity. Often people will share this information to make or accept payments. Now let's discuss identifying the more vigilant users who do not publicly post their information or use centralized services. This is usually done by associating crypto wallet addresses with their IP addresses. When a Bitcoin wallet is first set up, it generates a public-private key pair that is used to send and receive Bitcoin. The public key is then hashed to create the address. The wallet is basically software that stores the private key and interfaces with the Bitcoin network. So the wallet is associated with the device it's installed on. In some cases, it can be on multiple devices. And obviously, those devices are associated with IP addresses. Hardware wallets are a little different. We'll address this later. Associating crypto wallet addresses with the IP addresses involves mapping out the Bitcoin network. At any given time, there are tens of thousands of Bitcoin nodes. 
To complicate things more, nodes regularly go offline and new ones regularly come online, so this is no easy task. One way to map the network is by running your own Bitcoin nodes, which all have the Bitcoin Core software, so each node will broadcast a get address message to connected nodes, which then repeat it to other nodes they're connected with. It requests a list of available nodes on the network along with their IP addresses. But it's a peer discovery process, so nodes are not required to reply. We could also scan the internet for systems with port 8333 open, this is the Bitcoin protocol's port. While scanning the whole internet is probably not possible, organizations with lots of resources can scan large IP address ranges, so they can likely identify a lot of nodes. The nodes communicate with one another over TCP, which shows the source and destination ports in the packet header. That when those packets are packaged into IP packets on the network layer, the header will show the source and destination IP addresses. The internet service providers can see the transport layer and the network layer, so they will also have the IP addresses of Bitcoin nodes. There's actually a few websites that provide lists of active Bitcoin nodes such as bitnodes.io. Every time a wallet checks the balance or initiates a transaction, the wallet will communicate with a few nodes. This means that TCP and UDP packets are exchanged between the device hosting the wallet and those nodes. The wallets can communicate over a few ports including 8333 or 8332. The patterns in communications will easily differentiate wallets from nodes. Again, the ISB can see these packets. Although the packet payload is still encrypted, so they won't see the associated wallet addresses. Also, some decentralized wallets can interface, usually via RPC, with infrastructure and API providers like BlockCypher that facilitate access to the blockchain nodes. Some even host their own nodes. So depending on the backend infrastructure used, they may record IP addresses and other information. For example, Infra provides APIs for Ethereum wallets like MetaMask. They record IP addresses and other information. Unlike the ISP, the backend infrastructure provider could link the wallet addresses and the associated IP addresses together. Although IP addresses usually belong to routers, not the devices. Either way, they can be linked and this internet traffic can be analyzed against the public ledger for patterns. Although wallets, decentralized exchanges, and nodes can still communicate with one another through the Onion router or a VPN. This would hide their IP address from the ISP and each other. From bitnodes.io, which maps the Bitcoin network, we can see about 10,000 nodes are currently configured to communicate through the Onion router. But the ISP can still see which systems are communicating with the Onion router or a VPN. While it adds a layer of obfuscation, analyzing the timing and patterns of internet traffic between the Onion router servers, VPN servers, nodes, and other systems, and then comparing that to the transactions on the ledger may help identify the IP addresses and other identifiers of the wallets. Like we mentioned earlier, there is the possibility that crypto tracking companies and government agencies host their own nodes where they could collect wallet addresses and associated IP addresses of any wallet that connects with it over the open internet. Although there are some security and reliability concerns around connecting to a Bitcoin node, which is why wallets usually only connect with certain nodes. Some users may even host their own nodes for security and privacy, but this also means tracking and analytics in certain cases can be narrowed down to certain nodes. Remember us mentioning that unknown group that is suspected of linking Bitcoin transactions to IP addresses since 2018? They've been hosting Bitcoin nodes then connecting with other nodes on the internet to map their IP addresses and other information and listen for transaction initiation broadcasts on the Bitcoin network. Listening for when the transactions are initiated allows them to analyze the transactions against internet traffic more accurately because transaction processing causes about a 10-minute delay between its initiation and when it's posted on the ledger. Listening to multiple nodes and seeing which ones first propagate a transaction request could also potentially help identify which nodes wallets are communicating with. What is suspicious about these nodes is they mostly send messages and listen. Often they initiate connection handshakes without finishing and have obscure configurations, and they do everything through a proxy. All of this tracking has inspired the development of decentralized mixers like Tornado Cash that works with Ether. Users can use decentralized exchanges like Uniswap to exchange Bitcoin for Ether. Then they can deposit standard indistinguishable amounts of ETH or into a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. The smart contract then encrypts the transaction data using a zero knowledge protocol and then gives the depositor a piece of data proving they own the funds before mixing those encrypted funds with other users' encrypted funds in the smart contract. Tornado Cash uses a trustless, decentralized mixing process which means that there is no central authority or intermediary involved in the mixing process. Instead, the smart contract automatically mixes the funds according to a predetermined algorithm. 
Finally, the depositors use their proof data to withdraw standard indistinguishable amounts of ETH from a different Ethereum address. Similar to the Onion router and VPNs, these mixers work off of herd protection, meaning the more users or transactions, the harder it is to trace. The total deposit and withdrawal amounts can still be analyzed for patterns on the blockchain. So analyzing the timing and patterns of the internet communications and then comparing that to the transactions on the ledger may help identify the patterns that can ultimately be linked to IP addresses and other identifiers of the wallets. While Tornado Cash and other mixers unlink the depositing address from the withdrawing address, the withdrawing transactions are still linked with the mixer on the ledger, which will certainly attract attention, and any subsequent transactions on a centralized exchange will be flagged before allowing exchange for fiat currency. Tornado Cash was commonly used with money laundering, so OFAC made it illegal for United States citizens, residents, and companies to use it. Additionally, hardware wallets can complicate things more. When a user wants to transact from their hardware wallet, they connect it to a computer or mobile device and authorize the transaction using the hardware wallet's interface. The private key stored on the hardware wallet is used to sign the transaction, which is then broadcast to the blockchain network for confirmation. Since a hardware wallet can be plugged into different devices with different IP addresses, it will complicate associating the wallet address with a person's identity. Remember, this is assuming that the hardware wallet manufacturer doesn't have records of the wallet and its owner. Between the Onion router, VPNs, mixers, and hardware wallets, there are a lot of ways to obfuscate the identity behind the wallet address, although they all leave clues which can all be analyzed for patterns. Although each clue may not be statistically significant, but combine over time and may start to paint a more clear picture. On top of all of that, governments regulate how their currencies can be exchanged with crypto. So the conclusion is if users are careful, it's possible for crypto to be used anonymously, but that crypto won't be able to be converted to most major fiat currencies without exposing the real-world identity of the user. As far as the FBI and other government agencies seizing crypto, after they identify the system hosting the wallet, they can either compromise it or gain physical access to get the key. If the wallet communicates with the same nodes, they could compromise the systems hosting those nodes. This could potentially allow them to jump to the system hosting the wallet or even manipulate the wallet's view of the Bitcoin network and potentially steal funds. In the Colonial Pipeline case, Darkseid had a large attack surface from all their ransomware infrastructure, which could have first been exploited, leading the FBI to the system hosting the wallet.